So we're continuing our study through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to cover the first part of chapter 14 tonight, and I know that everybody's really excited about it um, because of the controversy. And, and I don't know, I, I may not be as controversial as you want me to be, but I'm just going to to tell you what I think uh, God's Word says. Um, last week we talked about love um, and, and agape or agape, the highest form of love. And it's the love that, that Christ exhibited. It's the love that puts others first, um, the love that we should put first because it is so vitally important to our Christian life. Love holds everything together. It's the foundation of our ministry. Um, without it, we have nothing. If we could speak every language, if we knew everything, if we understood everything, if we had every bit of faith and sacrificed every bit of what we had, without love, all of that is meaningless, worthless. We talked uh, about all the different attributes of love, how it's long-suffering, it's kind, it's, it's not rude, it's, it's not arrogant, it doesn't brag, it's not self-centered, it's slow to fight and quick to forgive. It bears, believes, it hopes, it endures all things. And love is eternal. But spiritual gifts are only temporary. Love is complete, but gifts are incomplete. Spiritual gifts will eventually go away, but love will remain for eternity. And this is where we're going to pick up tonight. And chapter 14 begins with that same love in view. And so we're going to go from one of the most widely accepted passages in Scripture to one of the most debated passages of Scripture. We're going to go from one of the most familiar passages in the Bible that has been cited many, many times and has been preached many, many times to one of the most unfamiliar passages to us, especially for Baptists. And, and I think, as I've said before, uh, it's due to a poor reading of the text or, or maybe just a not reading of the text. A lot of pastors just say, okay, we're just going to skip that because I don't, I don't want to go over it. Uh, um, but I think possibly um, it's just a lack of understanding of what is being said here. And, and it might just be because part of it seems to say things that we just don't believe. Things that we say, okay, uh, we don't do that. We, we don't believe that, so... Uh, we don't know how to deal with it, so we just move on. Um, whatever the case may be, um, I think it's important to first understand the main thrust of what Paul is trying to say, what he is getting at um, in this passage. Uh, and, and we start out with love comes first, and we learned that last week. Um, and, and that prophecy is superior to tongues or the gift of languages, and the main purpose of spiritual gifts is to edify the church, to build up the body of Christ. Now, I was talking to the youth a few Wednesday nights ago about this. When we assemble as a church, our main goal, the main goal should be to build each other up, to exhort one another to holiness, to encourage each other as we go through the struggle of living a Christ-like life. That should be our goal. And that's why we come together, for edification, for exhortation, for encouragement. And we see that, that theme as we go through um, all the chapter, um, this 14th chapter, uh, especially what we're going to talk about tonight. Another thing I want you to notice is a small but very distinct difference in the uses of the word tongue, singular, and tongues, plural. Okay, uh, this is a key to proper understanding of this chapter. Tongue singular is unknown, ecstatic or counterfeit. It's not the real thing. Okay, um, it's singular because all gibberish is just that, gibberish, right? There's only one kind of unintelligible language. There's only one kind of unknown tongues. All the rest of them are known. There's only one. And tongues, plural, should be understood to be the actual gift of language. And since there are many known languages, hence it's rendered as tongues, plural. 
And, and we'll, wa- we'll talk more next week about what this would actually look like um, in a worship service. So you'll have to come back to, uh, for that. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Just, that's a, just a preview. Um, so tonight we're going we're gonna to focus on the better gift of prophecy and how it functions to accomplish the goal of building the, the church. So stand with me if you would. Uh, As we go to our text, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 25 of chapter 14. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him, howbeit in the spirit that he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks unto men, unto edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. I would that you all spoke with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come to you, Speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they have, or except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, forasmuch as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room... Of the unlearned, say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what you say. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips when I will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophecy... Or prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all shall speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophesy, and there cometh in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. You can be seated. I know that was a lot. But we're just going to take it a little bit at a time. So, the first thing we see here is the apostle's edict. He he tells them, this this is what you need to do. And he had just got through all of chapter 13, all of that telling us that love was the greatest thing. So he tells them, pursue love. That's what you should do. He's telling 
uh, the Corinthians, he's telling us that love was the greatest thing. Love is the greatest. So we should put love first because it is the greatest thing. And it should be the foundation of everything we do as Christians. But we should also, we should also desire spiritual gifts. Now, Paul's making sure that the Corinthian believers understand that we understand that love is paramount, but spiritual gifts are still necessary to the body of Christ. Uh, we shouldn't desire, as he was talking in chapter 12, we shouldn't desire the showy gifts because they get more attention, but we shouldn't also abandon gifts altogether. We shouldn't say, oh, well, we shouldn't do those at all. That's what he's saying here. So we should follow after love, but still earnestly seek spiritual things, especially prophecy. Uh, the desire of everyone in the church should be to hear prophecy. And, and I don't mean to hear future predictions and what has been fulfilled and what hasn't. That's not the prophecy I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fourth telling or the telling forth of the word of God. That's what we should desire. Why? Because that is what brings about the building up of the church. Look at verse 2. <clears throat> For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks, speaks unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesies edifies the church. I would that you all spoke with tongues, but rather I that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh, speaks, sorry, speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So we have to look at the object of edification. And he talks about he who speaks in an unknown tongue or a tongue doesn't speak to men but to God. Now, many theologians will note in the Greek there is a lack of, of a definite article, okay? What does that mean? They think that it should be, it would be better translated that they speak to a God. They don't speak to men, but they speak to a God. And it's, it's very similar to Acts 17, 23, when Paul was when at, in Athens and he saw um, the altar to the unknown God, right? Same word. So they speak an unknown language to an unknown deity, no one understands them. That's what he said. No one understands them. They utter mysteries. Now, <clears throat> these are not the mysteries of God. These are mysteries associated with the mystery religions of paganism. Okay? In all of these pagan religions, only a privileged few could understand these mysteries. And it was all through special knowledge or, or gnosis. That's where the Gnostics come from. And so, he, and then when he speaks of the Spirit, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about man's spirit, or maybe even an evil spirit. Okay? The Corinthians, as we have learned over the course of this study, were carnal. And in their carnality, they had brought this ecstatic speech into their church. And they weren't concerned about clarity of Scripture. They weren't concerned about being understood. They were concerned about drama and the dramatic display that they would make. And it's very similar to modern, uh, the modern charismatic movement that we see today. If you look at the activities in their churches, don't go there. You can see it on YouTube. You don't have to go there. Um, but it's all about the show. That's what it's about. And the more chaotic, the better. That's what they think. But he says, on the, on the other hand, the one who prophesies, they speak to men and, and they bring men comfort by building them up, by encouraging them. The one who speaks in an unknown tongue, he exalts himself. That's what they do. Look at me. Look what I can do, right? <clears throat> but the one who speaks prophecy or God's word, they build up the church. Now, in verse 5, he switches to the plural, the, the actual. 
when he says, I wish you all could speak with tongues, known languages, but even more to prophecy. Because the one who prophesies is greater unless someone interprets the tongues. Why is that? Because prophecy edifies the church, not the individual. And that's the goal of all of our spiritual gifts, is to build up the church. And you're going to see that over and over, the theme, the theme repeated. Verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? So now we see the apostle's economy, what, what he thinks is profitable and what he thinks is not profitable. So he says, even if an apostle came to speak in tongues, plural, it wouldn't profit a church. There would be absolutely no benefit unless there was interpretation of what was said. Uh, and the revelation of what was said would convey the knowledge and, and the telling of God's word and thus the teaching. Because tongues by themselves are of no benefit to the church without interpretation. Everybody understands that, right? <clears throat> and Paul says, even, even if Paul himself spoke in a different language, if no one told the congregation what he was saying, how does that benefit the church? It doesn't. It's nonsense. So just think, when, when Brother uh, Candelario came uh, a month ago or so, if Brother Cliff had not told us what he was saying, it would have been of zero benefit to us. Okay? None. It sounded really cool. And I could tell that he was saying something important. And I could tell that he was very passionate about what he was saying. But without interpretation, it would be of no avail to us. Does everybody get that? I, I just want to be sure because there are times when I'm preaching that some of you look at me like I'm speaking a foreign language. So I just want to be sure. So let's, let's move on. Verse 7. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall, they, how shall it be known? What is piped or harped? For if a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. <clears throat> now, Paul illustrates the enigma of the unknown tongue. And he now uses musical instruments to further make his point about how useless random sounds um, or even legitimate languages are useless unless they are ordered or translated. And, and any, any parent of a child who is learning a musical instrument understands this. Okay? When they first start out, it just sounds like a mess of random sounds. Because that's what it is. Right? They're just figuring it out, and all you hear is, and you're like, what is happening? There's an animal dying somewhere. I don't know what's going on. But as they begin to learn it, it starts to sound like something. It starts to sound like something. You start to recognize it. And, and when you finally hear something you recognize, it, it sounds like music. Right? And it, it's beautiful. And really, there's nothing more beautiful, I think, than a group of instruments that play together and they're in complete sync, and they're harmonizing, right? The strings and, and the wind instruments and the percussion all together, it's a thing of beauty. It's a picture of unity and, and harmony. But without distinct notes, it's just noise, right? Everyone, y'all listen to modern music? I don't know how they call it music. It's just noise, okay? It doesn't make any sense. Um, the words don't make any sense either, but we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> but without distinct notes, it's just noise. Now, he talks about the, the, the trumpet or the bugle or the, or the shofar, or whatever you want to call it. But there were different sounds to indicate different commands. There were different patterns um, to indicate different directions that these people, the soldiers, were supposed to take. 
Um, there was one for retreat. There was one for advance. There was one to assemble. There was one to fall out, right? Different patterns to indicate different things to do. Now, if the, if the sounds weren't distinct, then the people were confused, right? They don't know. They don't know what, what, what just happened. That what, did they tell us to leave? Did they tell us to retreat? Did they tell us to advance? What's going on? And the same is true of our speech. If we just make random sounds that aren't intelligible, it's unproductive. It doesn't help anyone. It's confusing. It's disorderly. Look at verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Now, Paul says there there are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I don't know the meaning of the language, I'm going to be like a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is going to be a foreigner to me. And so Paul is trying to explain that the purpose of every known language is communication. That's what, that's what language is for, so we can communicate, so we can get together. right? Paul points out that all known languages are made for the purpose of communication, to bring clarity, not confusion. And, and he says that we'll sound like barbarians to each other. Do you know how barbarians got their name? Because all they said, all they said, sounded like bar, 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 to everyone else, right? That's why they called them barbarians. It's sort of like Groot. Everything he says sounds like I am Groot. But it means other things, right? Um, but the purpose of language is to bring people together so they can communicate with each other, to bring clarity to relationships and to answer questions, not to cause questions. The purpose of the gift of languages was to bring the gospel to people of another tongue, to people of a tongue that you didn't normally speak, or maybe you hadn't learned. That was the purpose. And at Pentecost, in the book of Acts, that's exactly what happened. Acts 2, 6 says... Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They heard their own language. They weren't confounded because someone was speaking an unknown unknown language and making a spectacle of themselves. That's not what happened. They heard in their own distinct language. And they were amazed that they were hearing, they were understanding what the apostles said in their own language. And they knew that the apostles didn't speak their language. That's why they were amazed. And this is what the gift of languages or the gift of tongues is for. Look at verse 12. Even so ye, forasmuch as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. And so we see the vital issue of edification. And I believe that this is really the key verse to this entire chapter. We should desire to have spiritual gifts. We should earnestly pursue spiritual things, but not for our own benefit. We should desire that the body be built up, not ourselves. We should seek the edification of the church, not self-edification. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, Paul shifts back to the unknown tongue, the counterfeit, the one that's fake. And we notice the emotional root of the unknown tongue. Now, He says that if you speak with an unknown tongue, that you should pray that you will know what you're saying. And I think he's really kind of poking them a little bit. Because he says, you speak this stuff and you have no idea what you said. No one has any idea what you said. And and if you don't know what you're saying, then how is someone else going to know what you're saying? 
How, how, what is the benefit of that? It doesn't benefit anyone but you. Because everybody's like, oh, look at that guy. He's super spiritual. I have no idea what he said, but he seems spiritual. That's what they were doing. And, and when he talks about his spirit praying, but his mind is unfruitful. This is most definitely not talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay? It, it really is just the word pneuma, which could mean breath or air, right? Something coming out of you. So he could say, my breath is praying, my breath is making noise, making sounds, but my mind is empty. And this is really how false religions operate, right? If, if you look at a lot of these false religions and, and, and really false teachers, they, they're very emotionally charged, it's all about emotions. It's all about feelings. But they are mentally disengaged. And they focus on feelings, not on facts. Uh, and, and they try to free the mind, right? Even empty the mind and let the heart or the feelings take over. Let the emotions take over. That is not a place or a state that you want to be in. Because your emotions are liars. They do not tell you the truth. So these people seek feeling when they worship. It's all about the spirit or how I feel. But what about the truth? What about the truth? Look at verse 15. He says, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when that thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen? At any giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what you say. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words of an unknown tongue. So now we see the rational foundation of effective worship. We worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not either or. It's both and. And, and the basis, really, the basis of true worship, of effective worship, is the truth. We can't base it on feelings. We can't base it on passion. And many times we talk about loving God with our heart and not our head, but we need both. We need both to be involved. Facts inform our belief, and our belief informs our emotions. And, and we should pray earnestly in our spirit, but we should also pray knowing the facts, knowing the facts of God's word, knowing that he is in control, knowing the promises that he has made to us in his word. That's how we should pray, not just with our heart, with our mind and gaze also. When we sing, we should sing with passion. We should. And with all our heart. But we need to sing truth. And we need to sing songs that are biblical. And I know a lot of people give me grief about this, but I don't really care. Because I want to sing songs that are biblical. I, I want what I'm singing to be true. I want it to be backed up by Scripture. And if it's not, I'm not going to sing it. Now, there are a lot of songs out there that sound really good. They do. But they have absolutely no basis in Scripture. And people will tell me, oh, it's a good song. And I'm like, I, I listen to the song. I'm like, I don't even know where they get this. They're like, well, but they said Jesus. I hear a lot of people say that. And it's usually not good. So <clears throat> we need to sing with our minds engaged. Now, how many songs do we sing? Uh, Y'all sang some songs tonight. You sang some this morning. How many songs do we sing that we don't even know what the words mean? Maybe we just don't care. Maybe we like how it sounds and it, like, we like the way it makes us feel, so we, we don't worry about it. How many do you sing that you don't know what, what words mean? And some of you even sing the wrong words because you don't read them. And you just kind of memorize them because you've sang them so many times. And just recently, I, I was talking to someone about, like, hey, I, I like to read songs. I like to read the words. 
And I like to see what is there before I sing the song so I can get in. And it brings so much more meaning. And, and, and I'm like, I really like to actually read the song before I sing it. And these people, they were amazed that they had been singing Jesus paid it all wrongly all this time. And this happens a lot. It does. And we sang it this morning. And it made me, it reminded me of it. But they thought that verse 2 was, Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change a leopard's spots and melt a heart of stone. And some of you looked at me like, those are the words. No, those aren't the words. It says he can change a leper's spots, not a leopard. The, the theme of that song is that he cures the incur, incurable. How does he do that? He does the impossible. Why? Because he's God. He paid it all. That's what that song's about. And we need to understand the words, and they should be clear, and they should convey a clear message backed up by Scripture. And now Paul continues, if you pray or if you praise God or you give thanks to, to God without understanding, without making sense, how can anyone say amen? How can, how can I say amen to that? You may very well be giving thanks, but no one really knows, and only you are edified. Only, only you are built up. And it's not about just the people hearing you. They don't get edified. It's just you. And, and then Paul gives thanks that he speaks in languages more than any other of the Corinthians. But he doesn't hold it high like they do. He says reasoning, understanding, teaching are far more important. How do we know that? Because he said he would rather speak five words, just five, of reasoning and meaning than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, the word for 10,000 here is, is murii, or murioi, which is really, it really means un innumerable, right? Um, countless. It's, it's where we get our word myriad from. So Paul was making the point by saying he would rather speak five clear words than countless unclear or unintelligible words. Now, finally, we see the primary purpose of tongues explained. Look at verse 20. He says, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Paul tells the church at Corinth, first of all, you have it inverted. You have it backwards. He says, don't be children in your understanding, be children in your malice, be mature in your understanding. But the Corinthians, like many churches today, were thinking and acting like babies. That's what he's telling them. But they were evil like adults. They were malicious. They were spiteful. And he says, listen, it should be the other way around. You should be unmalicious like children. And grown up in your understanding. But a lot of people, there's not, they're not grown up in their understanding. Uh, their biblical liter literacy is, level is very low. And, and that's what Paul was pointing out to the Corinthian church. He's like, you think you know everything, but you know very little. And we need to understand that we need to put aside what we feel. We need to put aside what we think we have experienced and think critically, think logically about the intent of tongues. And that's what he's telling them. Look at verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet, for all that, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are not... Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So, tongues indicate judgment. And Paul quotes Isaiah 28, 11, and 12, where it says, For with stammering lips in another tongue will he speak to his people. O whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. God spoke to his people, but they didn't listen. And just as before, 
in the Old Testament, when Israel heard unknown tongues, the gift of tongues, the gift of language, was a sign of judgment on unbelieving Israel. So Isaiah spoke of the judgment from Assyria. Jeremiah spoke of the judgment from Babylon in Jeremiah 5. He says, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou know not, neither understand what they say. So every time unknown languages come into the picture or languages that they didn't know, languages they didn't understand, it was a sign to Israel that they were in trouble because they didn't believe God. Right? In the Old Testament, God said, you need to do this and this, and they didn't do it. What happened? They were judged. Now, in the New Testament, the Jews would have understood, or at least they would have got a picture, oh no, <clears throat> when they heard the apostles speak at Pentecost in these different tongues. They would know that judgment is about to fall on them again. Why? Because they rejected Christ. And this included the destruction of, of Jerusalem in AD 70. That was part of the judgment. But prophecy, on the other hand, is beneficial to those who believe. Why? Because those are the people, those are the ones who understand it. Because the Spirit of God dwells in them. Now look at verse 23. He says, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? Tongues are inferior. And Paul points this out. If everyone could speak in another language, and the whole church came together and they did it, what would happen? Chaos. Confusion. And if an unbeliever or an outsider came in, they would think, you were, they would think all of you were out of your mind. And we're going to talk about this more in detail next week, but just know this. God is not the author of chaos or confusion. He's a God of peace. He's a God of order. Look at verse 24. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Tongues were spectacular. Tongues were flashy. But prophecy is far better. Why? Because prophecy incites true worship. Instead of an outsider or an unbeliever thinking you're crazy, if all of that noise was replaced by preaching the gospel, the outcome would be unfathomable. That's what he's saying. If everyone proclaimed God's word publicly, then men would be convicted of their sin. Souls would be redeemed and converted. And the result would be humility before God and true worship. And people will know that God is working and present. Not because people are speaking gibberish and acting crazy, but because God, God's word is proclaimed and lives are changed. That's how we know God is working. And Paul is painting a picture here of great contrast. The possible and the impossible. The Corinthians' desire versus God's desire. He says, if everyone spoke in tongues, which is what you want... But it's not possible. Then nothing is accomplished other than people thinking that you're crazy. But if everyone prophesies or pro proclaims the word of God, which is possible, then the church will be built up. The kingdom of God will be increased and true worship will be accomplished. And, and this is what we all should desire. Everyone won't have the gift of prophecy. Okay, I understand that. But everyone can proclaim the gospel. And don't get hung up on spiritual gifts and, and tongues and all the controversy uh, uh, surrounding these things. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim God's truth. And you will build up the church. You will increase God's kingdom. Now, as we, as we prepare to close and we stand together and, and Brother Russell comes and we prepare for our baptism service 
Hopefully you have a little better understanding of what is going on in this passage. Hopefully you have more answers than questions. Because that's the goal. I want to help you understand, not to confuse you. And that's, that's always my goal when we, when we come together. And I hope you see that this really wasn't about speaking or not speaking in tongues. It's about the purpose of our gifts. They're to edify, they're to exhort, they're to encourage each other. And this should be our goals as we come together as a church body. But are these your goals when you come here? Are you doing these things? Are you edifying? Are you exhorting? Are you encouraging? Are you building up the church? Or are you just building up yourself? Are you saying, look at me, look at what I can do? Are you saying, look at him, look at Christ? Don't be childish. Don't be malicious. There's no room for pride in the body of Christ. None. Lay it down. Repent. And maybe you've never repented of your sin. Maybe you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. If that's the case, you're outside of the body. You're without hope. But you can change that. You can change that right now. If you'll just repent. If you'll change your mind. Change your direction. Follow him. What will you decide to do?